This morning, our uh, text, <clears throat> excuse me, is John chapter 5. John chapter 5, we're going to be looking at uh, one verse in particular, and that is verse 44, but I'm going to back up just a bit and read a little bit of the context, uh, beginning in verse 30 of John chapter 5 through verse 37, but again, I want you, or excuse me, through verse um, uh, 47, but I want you to pay attention particularly to verse 44. John chapter 5, beginning in verse 30. Jesus says this, I can do nothing on my own initiative. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is just, because I do not seek my own will, but the will of Him who sent me. If I alone testify about myself, my testimony is not true. There is another who testifies of me. And I know that the testimony which he gives about me is true. You have sent to John, and he has testified to the truth. But the testimony which I receive is not from man, but I say these things so that you may be saved. He was the lamp that was burning and, and was shining, and you were willing to rejoice for a while in his light." But the testimony which I have is greater than the testimony of John, for the works which the Father has given me to accomplish, the very works that I do, testify about me, that the Father has sent me. And the Father who sent me, He has testified of me. You have neither heard His voice at any time, nor seen His form. You do not have His word abiding in you, for you do not believe Him whom He sent." You search the Scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. It is these that testify about me, and you are unwilling to come to me so that you may have life. I do not receive glory from men, but I know you, that you do not have the love of God in yourselves. I have come in my Father's name, and you do not receive me. If another comes in his own name, you will receive him. How can you believe when you receive glory from one another, and you do not seek the glory that is from the one and only God. Do not think that I will accuse you before the Father. The one who accuses you is Moses, in whom you have set your hope. For if you believed Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote about me. But if you do not believe his writings, how will you believe my words?" May the Lord bless His Word to our hearing uh, this morning. Again, Jesus is reproving the scribes and the Pharisees because they refused uh, to believe the testimony the Father had given of the Son, the testimony that He had given through John the Baptist, the testimony of the works that He had given Jesus Christ to do, the testimony of the Scriptures which all spoke about Him. But the other thing they were doing, which is contained in verse 44, is the fact that they were seeking glory from the world rather than seeking the glory that comes from God. And as long as they had their hearts set on the world, Jesus basically tells them that they could not believe in Him. So again, that's the root of the problem and the reason why they're willing to dismiss everything else that they saw was because they loved the world. This morning we're going to be looking at how we ought to have a single purpose in life, and that purpose is if we are to have a heart for God, if we are to be the kind of person that God can support, if we are to be His friends, then we need to have a single purpose in life, and we need to be seeking after Him, the honor that comes from Him by giving Him honor. Now again, as I've said, this is the theme that we're continuing, and I just want to review quickly where we're at since we're going to be dealing with this the entire day with regard to what we saw uh, last week. Last week we saw that one thing that He is looking for in us, that we might be those kinds of people that He can support, uh, the ones that He is looking for as His eyes go to and fro throughout the earth, is that we must not have a love for this world and that we do not be conformed to the world. John writes in 1 John 2.15, do not love the world. 
nor the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Jesus says essentially the same thing. And remember what Paul wrote in our evening message last week with regard to loving the world to the degree that you conform to the world. We are not to be conformed to the world. Paul says, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. We were reminded that we cannot be a friend to the world and of the world and be God's friend at the same time because to do so is represented by James as really abandoning our covenant with the Lord, our marriage covenant. Remember that the church is the bride of Christ. We are His spouse. And if we abandon Him to go to the world, which is what we have to do in order to go to the world, then we virtually become uh, adulterers. We commit spiritual adultery. James writes in James 4.4, 4, you adulteresses. Notice he uses the feminine form because the church of Christ is the bride of Christ. And if we abandon him, we become adulteresses. He says, you adulteresses. Do you not know that friendship with the world is hostility toward God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. You see, we can't love the things that God hates and expect that God is going to love us and, that, and expect that we are actually loving God at the same time. The Lord tells us we have to choose one or the other. We cannot have both because they are contrary to one another. Jesus says in Matthew 6, 24, No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and wealth. You cannot love God and the world. The two are opposite. And when you turn to one, you, at the same time, turn from the other. You cannot have both. Now, since that is the case, we better be sure that we understand exactly what the world is so that we can avoid loving the world to make sure that we're loving God. And how can you know what the world is? Well, you know, there's two ways you can do this. You can either study the world to find out what it is, study the Bible to see what it says about that, and we should be doing that, of course. But the other way is a better way, I think, and that is to study God. Get to know God better so that you can recognize the world more clearly, again, because the world is just the opposite of what God is. You know, uh, in, in our society, there are different uh, situations where people need to be able to recognize counterfeits, right? For instance, bank tellers and store clerks, they need to, to know if somebody is passing off to them counterfeit money so that they don't lose their employers uh, that particular income. So how do they train them to do it? Do they have them study every possible form of, of counterfeit currency until they can recognize all of them? and then they see it immediately? No, that's not what they do. What they do is they have them study the authentic item, what real money looks like until they know it so well that when they see something that isn't real money, they recognize it immediately. Well, the same thing is true here with regard to spiritual things. The more you know God, the better you get to know God, the more easily you will recognize those things which are contrary to God. And how can you get to know Him better? Well, in the same way that you get to know anybody else better, and that is by spending time with Him. The more time you spend with the Lord, the more time you spend in prayer, the more time you spend in the Word of God, the more time you spend walking with Him throughout the day, walking in the light as He is in the light according to the commandments of God and communing with Him uh, the better you will get to know Him, and the more easily you will see the world for what it really is. You will recognize it immediately and be able to turn away from it. Now, if you don't walk with the Lord, if you don't spend time with Him, if you don't get to know Him better, you will not be able to see the world clearly, at least as you might otherwise, if you do. And as long as we don't see the world clearly, and as long as we embrace 
elements of this world and love the world to that degree, we are going to quench the work of the Holy Spirit in our hearts. To that degree, we are not going to be that which honors the Lord. We're not going to be those the Lord is looking for to strongly support. It is important that we know the Lord. And again, remember that we're not talking here about a method that we are to follow to make it to heaven. We're not talking about uh, some kind of, of routine we need to follow to become a Christian. You don't become a Christian by spending time with God. You do it through the new birth, through faith and repentance by trusting Jesus Christ and turning from your sins. Uh, what we're talking about here is what must be true of true believers something that will be true of you if you're trusting Jesus, if you've turned from your sins. You will be spending time with the Lord. You will be becoming more like the Lord. You will love the things that He loves. You will walk with Him. You will grow in your understanding of Him and in your love for Him. And you will grow also at the same time in your hatred for the things of this world. By the way, it's just it's very helpful to understand how the process works because the Lord calls us to work along with Him. This isn't something that happens automatically. You don't just trust Jesus and then you, you're sort of pushed into becoming more like Him. It's something you have to do. You have to recognize your sins. You have to put your sins to death. You have to use the means of grace. You need to strive to become more like Jesus Christ. It's just that as a Christian, you have the desire and you have the power to do it, whereas you didn't have it before. All you wanted was the world. All you wanted was sin, and you didn't want Jesus Christ. So it begins with a new birth, but it's something that we have to put effort into. As a matter of fact, the images used in Scripture uh, teach us that we are to put all of our effort into it. It's like running a race and trying to be the one that wins. That's what the Christian life is about. It's like trying to take a kingdom by force. That's the kind of effort we are to be putting into becoming more like the Lord. So anyway, that's the goal. That's what we're seeking to do. And I, and I hope your desire is not only to become more like the Lord Jesus Christ, but in becoming more like Him to be more usable. Well, this is how you can be more usable. Uh, this is how your life will count for more in the kingdom of heaven is if you put aside the things of the world and seek after the things of the Lord. Now, we're going to look at that same topic from a different perspective this morning. This is another area that we should be working on to become more of the kind of person that God wants us to be, more of the kind of person that the Lord can actually support. What we're going to see this morning is we need to live with a single purpose, with a single goal. And what does the Lord tell us that that purpose should be? Well, I'll tell you one thing, it's not the same purpose that the world would tell you that we should be living for. It's not, you know, that we should try to get as much enjoyment, as much fun, as much pleasure, as much honor and glory, personal fame and riches as we possibly can because we only go around once in life and again, the one who dies with the most toys wins. No, we know that that would be a waste of our lives because the Bible tells us that the things of the world, everything the world has to offer, is vain. I mean, read the book of Ecclesiastes if you haven't read that in a while. Solomon, who was the, the wealthiest man on earth perhaps of all time, and the wisest, was able to uh, indulge in, in even those things which might be uh, lawful. And he found at the end of, of all this indulgence and all these pleasures that it was all vanity which means it was all worthless, it meant nothing. And why is that? Well, because ultimately at the end, end of the day, all of those things you have to leave behind, all of those things won't benefit you, all those things will only cost you and keep you away from doing that which is most important, and that is seeking to honor God. So if you spend your life seeking after the things of the world which are vain, in the end your life is going to count for absolutely nothing. I mean, Jesus did say, remember, what would it profit a man if he gained the whole world, but he lost his soul? 
Well, it would gain him nothing except an eternity of punishment. So if you want to have a life that really counts, then you need to be the kind of person that God can use. Your purpose in life needs to be to do what He made you to do, uh, what it is He redeemed you for, and that is to seek for His glory. Now, if you do this, if you seek to honor Him, not only will you actually give greater glory to God, but God will give you greater glory. He will give you greater honor. The Lord will actually make your life count. The thing that, you know, that we remember, the greatest men and women who ever lived who served the Lord, the thing that, uh, the reason why we remember them is because God honored them, because they sought to honor Him most of all. So be, this morning, let's begin by considering that we should do our best in this world to give glory to the Lord, but actually not to seek glory for ourselves, or excuse me, not to seek glory for ourselves from the world, but rather to seek the glory that God has to give us. Now, this evening we're going to consider how to do this. This morning I want us to consider the importance of seeking after the glory that God has to give rather than the glory of the world. And I can't think of a more important reason than the one that Jesus brings out in our text this morning. And we're going to look at this under just two points. The first one is that if we seek the glory that this world has to give, we're actually going to find out that we're not believers at all if we don't already know that. Because doing that is contrary to saving faith. Jesus basically tells the Pharisees, you cannot believe if you seek after the glory of this world. That's what you're after, you will lose heaven. But secondly, it's only seeking glory from God that is consistent with saving faith because that is what saving faith moves us to do. So first of all, let's consider that seeking glory from the world is contrary to saving faith. Jesus says, if you want to be honored by men, if you want the glory and fame that comes from this world, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. This is what he was telling the scribes and the Pharisees who actually wanted those things more than anything else. I mean, again, let me read our text, John 5, 44. Jesus says to them, how can you believe when you receive glory from one another? And you do not seek the glory that is from the one and only God. How can you believe? He says, basically, you can't believe as long as you were doing this. Now, what is Jesus talking about here? First of all, he was addressing the way the scribes and Pharisees actually lived. Because everything they did, they did for their own personal glory. They did this in the things that they said they were doing for God in their acts of personal piety. Remember, our Lord addresses this in the Sermon on the Mount by telling His disciples what not to do, by pointing to what it is they did. When they prayed, they stood on the street corner for everybody to see them praying to God. When they gave money to the poor, they literally sounded a trumpet before they put their money into the offering so that those around would see them and take note. They did this in their social activities. Whenever they attended banquets, they would always take the place of highest honor. You know, Jesus had this, a great example of what not to do, and He kept pointing out to His disciples, when you go, don't do this, don't do what they do, do this instead, take the lowest place, because they were the ones taking the highest place because they wanted the highest honor. When they went to the synagogues, in order to worship, they took the best seats in the synagogues, the seats, oddly enough, that were actually lined up out front, and they would sit facing the people so that the people who were worshiping would have to look at them. Well, that's a seat that I think nobody would want to take today. Everybody likes to sit in the back, not in the front, especially not in, in the front here for everybody else to see them. But that's what they wanted because it gave them recognition. They even liked the honor in their calling as, as scribes, as lawyers, as, as teachers of the law, of being called rabbi, which means teacher. It was a 
you know, a title of respect. They also believed that when the Messiah came and he set up his kingdom, and they thought his kingdom would be a political kingdom that would actually overthrow Rome and return control of the kingdom of the Jews to the Jews themselves, that they themselves would receive the greatest places of honor. They sought glory. They wanted glory for themselves. But the problem was they were seeking this glory from men and not from God. Now, what does Jesus say to them here? He says, if this is what they wanted, they would not be able to believe in Him. As long as their hearts were for the world, they could not trust Jesus Christ, which means they could not receive Him as the Messiah, which means they could not enter into heaven at last. And what this means is exactly the same thing John said last time we saw, and I've already read this morning, do not love the world or the things of the world. Anyone who loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Jesus is saying the same thing to them. Now, why is it that they couldn't love both at the same time? Why couldn't they embrace Jesus and believe on him as long as they had a heart for the world? The reason, again, is because the two of them are exact opposites. This is not what Jesus came to offer them. That's not what his kingdom was all about, which is why Jesus, when he was teaching, would contrast what he wanted his disciples to do with what these men were actually doing. Jesus says, when you pray, don't stand on the street corner, but go in secret and pray in secret so that only the Father sees. When you do an act of charity and you give money to the poor, don't blow a trumpet but instead do it secretly away from others so that your right hand doesn't even know what your left hand is doing, so that only the Father sees. When you go to a banquet, don't take the place of highest honor, but take the place of lowest honor. Same thing would be true when they go to worship, so that if the Lord is pleased to do so, He may exalt them or move them up. And as far as desiring places of honor in a political kingdom on earth, what did Jesus tell His disciples? He says, don't be like the Pharisees and don't be like the leaders of the Gentiles who like to lord it over one another. Instead, He said, humble yourself and become the servant of all because that is the one who is going to be exalted. Well, the fact is the scribes and the Pharisees, they loved all these things that Jesus was telling His disciples not to do. And how can men who love the world and who love this honor and glory from the world, how could they ever love and embrace a Savior who is telling them that they need to be opposed to all those things, they need to do just the opposite? Well, the fact is they couldn't love Him because... They loved the world. Their hearts were inclined in an opposite direction. And as long as they had that love of the world, they were going to perish along with the world unless the Lord changed their hearts. Again, if you love the world, the love of the Father is not in you. James says, if you become a friend of this world, you become the enemy of God. You cannot have it both ways. Now, they were seeking the honor that comes from men, and what is it they should have been seeking instead? Well, the honor that comes from God, because that's the only thing that's really, of course, valuable, but it's the only thing, too, that is consistent with saving faith. His honor is what you get when you do what is right for His honor, for God, and not for yourself. Again. Think about the things that Jesus said in contrast to what the Pharisees were doing. When you pray, pray in secret so that the Father who sees in secret will honor you openly. That's why they should give in secret because they are seeking to honor the Father. That's why they should seek the lowest places in public. That's why they should humble themselves and serve rather than being served because these are the things God says He will honor. Jesus says, your Father who sees in secret will reward you openly. He will 
move you up higher and give you honor in sight of everyone at the table if you take the lowest place. He will make you the greatest in His kingdom if you humble yourself and become the servant of all. This is what the Pharisees should have been seeking rather than what they were seeking. And by the way, when you are seeking the things that God tells you you should be seeking, then you show that you really believe that what Jesus says is true. It also reveals that your heart has been changed because now you want what God wants you to have, what He tells you to go after, what He has to give. You want Him and you don't want the world. Basically, it shows that you have saving faith and that you will enter the kingdom of heaven at last. When you are seeking the honor that comes from God and not seeking the honor that comes from the world. Now, the most important thing that I want you to see this morning, of course, is how does this apply to you and to me? What difference does it make? Well, first of all, it calls us to examine our hearts. I mean, what kind of heart do you have? What do you want in this life? What do you hope to gain from this world and the time you have in this world? Do you want the things of, the, of this world? Is that what you're after? You know, most people, it's a big house, nice car, enough money to take care of your needs and kind of do whatever you want to do. Some people have higher ambitions. They want to be perhaps a, an owner of a business or maybe the CEO of a great company. Uh, others like glamour. They like recognition. They like fame. So they want to be a celebrity. Do you want to be a celebrity? Do you want to be a, a great sports figure? Do you want to be the strongest man in the world or perhaps uh, you know, the greatest bodybuilder? Do you want to be the, the greatest uh, you know, sports player with regard to baseball, football, basketball? a great actor, a great singer? Do you want people to come and, and see you perform and think that you're really good? Uh, watch your movies, come to your concerts? Uh, do you want to make great discoveries? Uh, you know, become a scientist or uh, maybe become a writer and get a Pulitzer Prize for something. Do you want to do something great in this life, something uh, historic, of historic value so that your name gets put in the history books? so that you'll be remembered because we all have to leave someday. I think just about everybody who comes into the world wants to be remembered. Well, you need to ask yourself this question. If that's what you want, how is that any different than what the scribes and the Pharisees wanted? I mean, really, all they wanted was to be recognized for what they were and to be honored and praised by the people. You know, how is that any different? It really isn't any different. But if this is what you want, then what is Jesus actually saying to you? Well, He says to you the same thing He said to the Pharisees. How can you believe when you receive glory from one another and you do not seek the glory that is from the one and only God? How can you love Him? when you're only seeking the things of the world for yourself and you're not seeking God. I mean, didn't Jesus say that if you are to follow Him, you must be willing to let go of the world. You must be willing to let go of your own life. You must be willing to pick up your cross and follow after Him. You have to be willing to let go of everything. You can no longer do what you did before to be seen by others. You must do what you do in secret so that only the Father sees. You can no longer serve yourself or expect other people to serve you, but you need to humble yourself to serve others. You can no longer live for your own glory, but you need to live for His glory. Again, remember, Jesus says you can't serve two masters. You must choose one or the other. You can't have both. If you want to go to heaven, you have to choose to serve Him. You have to live for His glory. So first of all, examine your hearts and see what it is you really want. What do you want? If you want the world, well, then you have a heart of a Pharisee. You have a heart of a scribe. And Jesus says to you this morning exactly what He said to him. But secondly, 
On the other hand, do you want that honor that comes from God? Now, that is the honor that you should be seeking after, and that is the honor you will be seeking after if you are a true believer here this morning. Again, don't you want your life to count for something? If you go after the world, it's going to count for nothing. Even if you got your name in the history book, even if you became the greatest singer, the greatest celebrity, at the end of your life, it would mean absolutely nothing when you stand before God if you've done those things purely for your own glory. And to do those kinds of things today pretty much means that. I mean, look at the things that celebrities do in order to get the cameras on them. You know, it's pretty ungodly and immoral. That's what you have to do to get that, that kind of glory. Is that, if that's what you want, your life will count for nothing. But if you want your life to count for something, this is the kind of honor that you want, the kind of honor that comes from God. Is that what you want? What kind of honors does the Lord give? Well, we've already seen. God looks to and fro throughout the earth in order to find someone whose heart is completely His, completely His, so that He might strongly support that individual. Do you think that's going to make a difference in how your life is going to come out in, in this world? It's going to make a huge difference. It's going to make your life count for something, something that really matters, something that's going to matter even after this life is done because you've been living for Him. Do you want the other honors that God is willing to bestow on His children, for instance, being His children? You know how sometimes we, we look at the children of the president and we say, wouldn't it be great to be the president's children. Now, maybe in some cases and maybe not in others, you know, depending upon who's president. Or if we see somebody who's a king, you know, and we think, wouldn't it be great to be the children of royalty as we see all the, you know, all the recognition that's given to the, to the children that are involved in, you know, in the, uh, the family of uh, the royalty in England, for instance, you know, all the attention they get and notoriety and all the pomp and, and circumstance. Well, I think we all realize that those kinds of children are honored, aren't they? They receive the kind of honor that actually comes from the world. But what about the honor of being the children of God? Is that an honor? It, it is a much greater honor, an infinitely greater honor than that honor which is bestowed upon those who are the children of earthly dignitaries. That is the honor God bestows on those who seek His honor. The honor of bearing His image, of becoming like Him in this world. It is an honor to live the life of a Christian and to reflect the image of Christ and even to suffer in His place. There is the honor He bestows of raising you to heaven when you die. Remember, there's only two places that every single soul in this world is going to go to at the end of their days. When they die, they're either going to go to heaven or hell. Which do you think is a greater honor? Which one do you want? So the honor that God bestows is that He will raise you to heaven. He will give you the crown of life. You will rule and reign with Jesus Christ. You will be the heirs of His kingdom, a kingdom which we know from Scripture is a kingdom of perfect righteousness, peace, blessing, love, one that is going to exist after all the kingdoms of the earth have turned to dust and after all their glory and all their possessions and all the things you might have gained from them is going to be destroyed, this kingdom is going to continue forever. What kind of an honor is it to be an heir of that eternal kingdom versus the kingdom of this world? Everything that the world has to offer is one day going to be destroyed. And so as you contrast, you know, the world and the honors that it has with the eternal kingdom of God and heaven and the honors that He bestows, which of these things do you really want? Well, if you've been born again by God, if you are a child of God, then you want the honors that come from God. And the reason why you do is because your eyes have been opened to see just how precious these things really are, to see their beauty and their value. And if you are a believer here this morning, your eyes have also been opened to see that what the Bible says, what Solomon says about the world is equally true, that it is vanity, that none of it in the end really matters. It is worthless as far as eternity is concerned. 
except for what you use of the good things of the world to serve the Lord. Well, if you find after comparing the two that what you really want are the honors of this world more than the honors that come from God, then remember what Jesus says this morning. How will you be able to be saved if you seek honor from the world and you do not seek the honor that comes from God? If you choose the, the desires, the love of the Pharisee, the path of the Pharisee, you're also choosing the destination of the Pharisee, which is eternal destruction in hell. Those who love the world will perish with the world. Now, if that is your situation here this morning, realize you need to turn from that path or you will perish. So turn from that path. Trust the Lord to save you. Turn from your sins and then begin to seek those honors that the Lord has to give, which are infinitely more precious. And for those of you who are believers this morning, remember, the world, again, as one of the writers of old put it, is like a golden bait that covers a hook, and Satan is using it to fish, and he's fishing after you, and he knows how to bait the hook for you. He knows exactly what it is in this world that will stumble you, and he's going to dangle it in front of your eyes, and he's going to try to snare you on it, and he's going to try to cost you big time. Well, don't be deceived by the enemy. You know what the Lord says about the world. You know God. You know what He loves. You, you recognize the world when you see it. Turn away from it and don't get ensnared on it, but instead seek those honors that come from God. Seek to become the kind of person that He will support. He will support the kind of person who is seeking after the honors that come from Him and not from the world. So if you want your life to count, seek after that honor rather than the honor of the world. Now this evening we're going to consider how to gain more of the honor that comes from God and we're going to see how consistent that is with, of course, the way that we are to gain the honor that God has to give. It steers us away from the world and it steers us on the path that God has laid out for us, the straight and the narrow path as John Bunyan portrays it in Pilgrim's Progress, it will help us keep on the good path so that we may honor the Lord and receive the honors that come from Him. Let's, let's spend a few moments now in silent prayer and let's again ask the Lord to apply His Word to our lives.